Hi soldiers, today we will be fighting the Battle of Normandy, exploring its ins and outs. Without further ado, let's dive into the video. Operation Overlord aka Battle of Normandy, was one of the code names given to the Northwestern European invasion of the Allied. It happened to be one of the major operations or battles, marking the beginning of the invasion of Western Europe, which was successfully liberated during World War II. Launched on 6 June, 1944, it is known as D-Day, the Normandy Landings, Operation Neptune. Preceded by a 1,200-plane airborne assault, more than 5,000 vessels carrying 160,000 troops began crossing the English Channel on June 6. By the end of August, more than 2 million Allied troops were in France. The decision to undertake cross-channel landings in 1944 was taken at the Trident Conference in Washington, held in May 1943. General Dwight D. Eisenhower was appointed the commander of Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, and General Bernard Montgomery was named the commander of the 21st Army Group, which comprised all land forces involved in the operation. The coast of Normandy in the northwest of France, sectors Utah, and Omaha, was chosen as the landing site for the Americans, and sword and gold for the British. The Canadians were to use Juno. In agreement with the conditions that were expected on the Normandy beachhead, special technology was developed for the occasion, two artificial ports, which came to be called Mulberry Harbors, and a series of specialized tanks, known to the soldiers as Hobart's Funnies. The Allies had been preparing a great military deception for several months before the landings, which they gave the general code name Operation Bodyguard, using electronic and visual misinformation with the objective to confuse the Germans as to the date and location of the principal landings. Adolf Hitler appointed Field Marshal Erwin Rommel with the responsibility of developing all fortifications along the proclaimed Atlantic Wall in anticipation of the landings in France. On the first day, the Allies did not achieve the targets but got a weak footing, which they strengthened gradually after capturing the port at Cherbourg on 26 June and the city of Caen on 21 July. They were a German counteroffensive in reaction to Allied advances, all the way up to 7 August but it failed. By the 19th of August, 50,000 soldiers of the 7th German Army were trapped inside the Falaise pocket. Second was the invasion from the Mediterranean Sea into southern France, codenamed Operation Dragoon, on August 15, and then came the liberation of Paris on August 25. German forces retreated east across the Seine on August 30, 1944, marking the close of Operation Overlord. Preparing for D-Day That June 1940 victory, as of that time, was hailed one of the most famous in history when Germany, under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, had emerged victorious, defeating France. On 4 June, the remainder of the British and other Allied troops, estimated at over 338,000, including much of the BIF, were ordered to be evacuated to England, leaving only about 30,000. A report to Prime Minister Winston Churchill on 4 October said that the British planners figured it would be impossible to re-establish a foothold on the continent even with the Commonwealth countries and the assistance of the United States. On the other hand, the second plan of invasion in Western Europe became even more apparent when the Soviet Union was invaded by the Axis in June 1941. Churchill refused, since even with American help, the British had not enough forces for such a blow and he did not want to repeat costly frontal assaults, as had occurred at the Somme and Passchendaele during World War I. The 1942-43 period saw consideration of two tentative plans, Operation Roundup and Operation Sledgehammer. Both were considered by the British to be impractical and unlikely to succeed. Then the Allies broadened their actions in the Mediterranean by invading French North Africa in November 1942, Sicily in July 1943, and Italy in September of that same year. The campaigns proved valuable experience in the troops' amphibious warfare. At the Washington Trident Conference in May 1943, the decision was taken to launch the cross-channel invasion within the next year. Churchill argued that the main thrust into Germany by the Allies should be from the Mediterranean theater, but the American generals, since they were contributing the bulk of men and equipment, argued otherwise. British Lieutenant General Frederick E. Morgan was appointed Chief of Staff to begin detailed planning. Early plans were highly constrained by the number of available landing craft, as most of them were already committed in the Mediterranean and the Pacific. Lessons had been learned from the Dieppe Raid of August 19, 1942, and it had been determined that the Allies would not assault directly a heavily defended French seaport in their first landing against the enemy-held coast. Failure at Dieppe had further underlined the need for adequate artillery and air support, particularly close air support, and specialized ships able to travel extremely close to shore. The short operating range of British aircraft, like the Spitfire and Typhoon, in particular, limited the number of potential landing sites, for comprehensive air support depended upon having planes overhead for as long as possible. It was considered to be on Brittany, the Cotentin Peninsula, and in Normandy and the Pas de Calais. 
For as much as Brittany and Cotentin were peninsulas, the Germans would have cut off the Allied thrust at a relatively narrow isthmus. The closest point to Britain on the continent is Pas de Calais, which hosted V1 and V2 rockets launch sites. Therefore, the Germans regarded it as the most likely initial landing zone and, hence, the most fortified region. The latter, on the other hand, had little space for the Allies to expand, as it is bounded by several rivers and canals. On the other hand, such operations from a broad front of landings in Normandy would permit simultaneous threats against the port of Cherbourg, the coastal ports further west in Brittany, and an overland attack towards Paris and eventually into Germany. Normandy was, therefore, decided as the place of landing. The greatest single weakness of the coast of Normandy, the absence of port installations, would be counteracted by the construction and establishment of artificial harbors. The Cossack staff intended the operation to commence on May 1, 1944. The first draft of this plan to receive approval was during the Quebec Conference in August 1943. The supreme commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces, Schaaf, was General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Most notable of the appointments in land forces was General Bernard Montgomery, who was chosen as commander of the 21st Army Group, under which came all the land forces that would partake in the invasion. After several revisions, on December 31, 1943, Eisenhower and Montgomery saw the Cossack plan. This showed amphibious landings by three divisions, with two more in support. The two generals insisted forthwith that the scale of the initial invasion be expanded to five divisions, with airborne descents by three more divisions so that operations on a wider front could be carried out and to speed the capture of the port at Cherbourg. This put in the new requirement for additional landing craft, and thus pushed the invasion back one full month to June of 1944. In the end, 39 divisions took part in the fighting in Normandy, 22 were American, 12 British, 3 Canadian, 1 Polish, while the remaining numbers were constituted by a division of French contingents amounting to more than a million. Allies planning the invasion. Dubbed Overlord, the objective was the creation of a large-scale lodgment on the continent. The actual military invasion was named Operation Neptune, though commonly referred to as D-Day by the public. Desiring the necessary air superiority to ensure a successful invasion, the Allies undertook a point-blank strategic bombing campaign against German aircraft production, fuel supplies, and airfields. Under the transport plan, communications infrastructure, and road and rail links were to be bombed so that the south of France would be cut off and to make it more difficult to bring up fresh reinforcements. These were elaborate deceptions. They were used in such a way that they did not give the actual location of the invasion. Part of what was supposed to be kept secret from the Germans was the exact timing and location of the invasion. Therefore, it was in the offing to forestall the German preparations through much elaborate deception. The coastline of Normandy was divided into 17 sectors of assault, with code names using a spelling alphabet, from Abel west of Omaha to Roger on the eastern flank of Sword. Eight further sectors were added when the invasion was extended to include Utah on the Cotentin Peninsula. Sectors were further subdivided into beaches identified by the colors green, red, and white. Allied planners envisioned preceding the seaborne landings with airborne drops, the former to secure the Orne River bridges and the latter near Caen on the eastern flank, and the latter to seize the crossings over the Merdere River. The capture of Carrington, Isigny, Bayou, and Caen was now the target. The Americans landing at Utah and Omaha was to hem in the Cotentin Peninsula and take the port facilities at Cherbourg. The British were to secure Caen from Sword and Gold, Canadians from Juneau, to hold the front from Camon Levente to the southeast of Caen, meanwhile set near Caen in the advance of airfields. It was this reasoning, therefore, that indicated that the capture of Caen by the forces of the Anglo-Canadians provided them with a very suitable staging area for a push south to capture the town of Falaise and its surrounding. A secure lodgment would be established, and within three weeks, all the territory captured to the north of the avranche falaise line should be held. This was to be a place of safe lodgment for the Allies. Then, the Allied armies would swing left to advance towards the River Seine. The invasion fleet, under Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey, was divided between the Western Naval Task Force, under Admiral Alan G. Kirk, supporting the American sectors, and the Eastern Naval Task Force, under Admiral Sir Philip Vian, in the British and Canadian sectors. First Army American forces included Seven Corps, Utah, and V Corps, Omaha, all of which were under the command of Lieutenant General Omar Bradley. 30 Corps was assigned to Gold, and I Corps to Juno and Sword. The second British Army was under the command of Lieutenant General Miles Dempsey. The land forces belonged to Montgomery's overall command, and the Air Command was in the hands of Air Chief Marshal Sir Trafford Lee Mallory. The 1st Canadian Army was an overlay in which many Polish, 
Belgian, and Dutch personnel and units served with distinction, and other nationalities also participated from other Allied nations in the campaign. Recon Missions Reconnaissance, Allied Expeditionary Air Force photo reconnaissance missions, numbering more than 3,200, were flown from April 1944 to the beginning of the invasion. The altitude of the photographs of the coast was taken very low so that the troops could see the coast, with its details of obstacles on the beach and defense works, comprising bunkers and gun emplacements. For that reason, that work had to be done across the whole European coastline in order to not give the Germans an alert about where the invasion would be taking place. In many cases, inland terrain, bridges, troop emplacements, and buildings were also photographed from several angles, giving the Allies maximal information. Simultaneously, members of combined operations pilotage parties covertly prepared detailed harbor maps with sounding depths. A call for holiday snaps and postcards of Europe broadcast over the BBC brought a response of over 10 million items, some of which proved to be of value. The information was collected with the aid of the French resistance and helped produce details of the movements of Axis troops and the construction techniques used by the Germans for bunkers and other defense installations. The Enigma machine encoded most of the German radio messages, amidst other coding methods, and the codes were changed at intervals. As soon as they were received, the staff at Bletchley Park worked to break the code as rapidly as possible in order to give the Allies prior information with regard to German plans and movements of their troops. This information had been codenamed Ultra Intelligence by British military intelligence because it had to be produced only to the top level of commanders. By the end of March, the Enigma code used by Field Marshal Gerrit von Rundstedt, Supreme Commander West, Oberbefehlshaber West, OB West, of the Western Front, was broken. By the 17th, the German intelligence agency had changed the Enigma codes right after the 6th of June, and the Allies consistently could read it again. Tech. Both of these responses are to lessons learned at Dieppe, yet each applied in uniquely new ways by the Allies to help ensure the success of Overlord. On top of the preliminary offshore bombardment and aerial assaults, some landing craft were mounted with artillery and anti-tank guns to deliver close and support fire. The final decision was that of not attacking the heavily protected French ports outright, and for this reason, two artificial ports, called Mulberry Harbors, were designed by Cossack planners. Each had a floating outer breakwater, inner concrete caisson, referred to as Phoenix Breakwaters, and a number of floating piers. These harbors were supplemented by blockship shelters, given the cover name Gooseberries. In anticipation of the difficult supplies of fuel, or even the total lack of it on the continent, the Allies built a pipeline under the ocean, Pluto. Three-inch specially developed pipes were laid under the channel from the Isle of Wight to Cherbourg by D-Day Plus 18. However, technical problems, and delay in capturing Cherbourg, meant it was not until 22 September that the pipeline was in operation. A second line was laid from Dungeness to Boulogne in late October. A series of specialized tanks, named Hobart's Funnies by the British military, was built to deal with conditions that could be expected during the Normandy campaign. Developed under the direct leadership of Major General Percy Hobart, this was just a specially modified M4 Sherman and Churchill tanks. Besides, there was also the Sherman Crab tank, mine flails, the Churchill Crocodile, a flamethrower tank, and the armored ramp carrier, which could be used as a bridge by other tanks to scale seawalls or to overcome other obstacles. The beaches also had, in some areas, soft clay that could not take the weight of tanks. A bobbin tank would have, therefore, overcome that obstacle by sending a roller of matting over the soft surface and leaving it in place as a path for more conventional tanks. The Churchill was adapted as an AVER, Assault Vehicle Royal Engineers, for the performance of a very wide range of combat engineering tasks, including bridge laying, it was armed with a demolition gun capable of firing huge charges into pillboxes. Another from Hobart's group, the duplex drive tank, DD tank, was a self-propelled amphibious tank which floated with a waterproof canvas screen inflated with compressed air. They were easily swamped, and on D-Day, many especially at Omaha sank before reaching the shore. Military Deception Leading up to the invasion, the Allies pursued Operation Bodyguard, the overall strategy designed to mislead the Germans as to the date and location of the main Allied landings. Fortitude included Fortitude North, a misinformation campaign using false radio traffic to lure the Germans into expecting an attack on Norway, and Fortitude South, a major deception designed to mislead the Germans into believing that the landings would take place at Pas de Calais in July. They established a fictitious 1st U.S. Army group claimed to be headquartered in Canton, Sussex, and commanded by Lt. Gen. George S. Patton. Dummy tanks, trucks, and landing craft were introduced by the Allies, and they were placed at positions near the coast. 
Other military units sent into the area included the 2nd Canadian Corps and the 2nd Canadian Division, all as part of the improvement of illusion that a big force was massing in the Pas de Calais in preparation for the upcoming assault on Calais. The hoax was carried out by broadcasting counterfeit radio traffic, while mixing this with real radio messages of the 21st Army Group, first routed to Kent via landline, and then broadcast, all in an effort to give the Germans the impression that the bulk of the Allied troops were there. Patton was to remain based in England until 6 July, a maneuver he would later explain was designed to deceive the Germans into believing a second attack would take place at Calais. Military and civilian personnel agreed on the import of this secrecy, while the invasion troops remained as isolated as conditions would permit, especially just before the invasion. General Henry J. F. Miller of the United States was dishonorably sent back to the United States after he disclosed the date at a party. The Germans believed that by then, they had a broad network of spies operating within the UK. In fact, all the agents had been captured by then, some turning into double agents and working for the Allies in the double-cross system. Juan Pujol Garcia, a double agent known under the code name Garbo, was a Spaniard and an opponent of the Nazis. During two years leading up to D-Day, he had devised through deception a whole network of fakes that the Germans had approved as authentic in order to obtain intelligence about them. Over the months before the D-Day landings, Pujol sent hundreds of messages to his superiors in Madrid, especially prepared by British intelligence, to persuade the Germans that the attack would come in July at Calais. In preparation for the landings, the RAF destroyed many of the German radar stations along the French coast. The night before the invasion, under Operation Taxable, 617 Squadron, the famous Dambusters, dropped strips of window, metal foil that German radar operators interpreted as a naval convoy approaching Cap d'Antifer, about 80 kilometers from the actual D-Day landings. This was enforced by the group of small vessels towing barrage balloons. Number 218 Squadron RAF also dropped window near Boulogne sur Mer in Operation Glimmer. That very night, a small group of Special Air Service, SAS, operators were busy deploying dummy paratroopers over Le Havre and Isigny. Those were the dummies that made the Germans feel as if they had an impression of another airborne assault and so misled them. Security and practice. Some exercises occurred even before the landings of the Overlord, in particular, already at the beginning of July 1943. In Slapton in Devon, for example, the town was evacuated in December 1943 to be taken over by armed forces as a training exercise site, which included landing craft and the management of beach obstacles. There was a friendly fire incident there on April 27, 1944, resulting in the death of as many as 450 people. On the next day, another estimated 749 American servicemen died when German torpedo boats surprised elements of assault force U, conducting Exercise Tiger, from their landing ships. Combined operations carried out large-scale landing exercises, for example, an exercise with live ammunition at the Combined Training Centre at Inverary in Scotland. Naval exercises went on in Northern Ireland, and hospitals in London and elsewhere carried out rehearsals for how they would cope with the anticipated floods of casualties. Paratroopers went on with exercises, including a huge demonstration drop on March 23, 1944, seen by Churchill, Eisenhower, and other top brass. Forming an important ingredient in all the plans for landings was tactical surprise. In fact, exactitude of date and location of the landings was known to none but the topmost of the higher command. By the end of May, men had been sealed in their marshalling areas with no more communication with the outside world. Soldiers were briefed by the use of maps that were accurate in every detail but place names, with most of them not informed where they were headed until they actually departed by ship. A news blackout in Britain further helped in the effectiveness of the deception operations. Travel from and to the Republic of Ireland was banned, and travel close to the coast of England to within several kilometres was restricted. Due to the weather, the conditions on when the invasion could take place even specified a set of invasion planners, considering in each month only so many days suitable. They actually wanted a full moon because it would allow the illumination of the pilots of the aircraft and have the highest tides. The ideal, therefore, would be to schedule the landings a little before dawn, with the tide about midway between low and high tide, coming in. This would improve visibility of the obstacles the enemy had placed on the beach but minimize the time of exposure that the men would be in the open. Specific criteria also included wind speed, visibility, and cloud cover. Eisenhower had tentatively set the 5th of June as the date for the assault, but on the 4th of June, it became apparent that very many of the required conditions for an invasion were not at all favorable. Among them were high winds and heavy seas, which would have rendered it impossible for the launching of landing craft and low clouds for the aircraft to locate their targets. By the evening of June 4, it was the Allied meteorological team, 
headed by Group Captain James Stagg of the Royal Air Force, which first forecast the clearing of the weather for the invasion to proceed on June 6. He met the Commander-in-Chief, General Eisenhower, and other top commanders in Southwick House in Hampshire to discuss the situation. General Montgomery and Major General Walter Bettel Smith, Eisenhower's Chief of Staff, were most anxious that the invasion should be launched. Admiral Bertram Ramsey was ready to risk his ships, whereas Air Chief Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory had feared that the conditions would be unfavorable for the Allied aircraft. After days of debate, he did make the decision to go ahead with the invasion. However, Allied Atlantic relative control with the Germans still meant the meteorologists of Germany did not have the advantage of much information on incoming weather patterns as had been extended to them by the Allies. The Luftwaffe Meteorological Center in Paris predicted two weeks of stormy weather, after many Wehrmacht commanders in France had been given leave to attend the war games in Rennes, and after men in many of the units were given leave. Marshal Erwin Rommel had returned to Germany for his wife's birthday and to meet Hitler to get more tanks. Had Eisenhower postponed the invasion again, the next available period for him to try for the right combination of tides but without the desirable full moon was two weeks later, from 18 to 20 June. It turned out, by that time, the invaders were to run into a major storm of four days duration, from June 19 through June 22, that precluded the initial landings. Preps and defenses of Germany. He would then have 50 Nazi German divisions at his disposal in France and the Low Countries, together with another 18 divisions in Denmark and Norway. Another 15 divisions were being formed in Nazi Germany without there being, by that fact, a strategic reserve in the same. The 15th Army, led by General Oberst, Colonel General, Hans von Samoth, defended the area around Calais, and the 7th Army, commanded by General Oberst Friedrich Dahlmann, covered Normandy for defense. The fighting losses during the entire war, especially at the Eastern Front, were such that they could not pull more able young men away from the Germans. The German soldiers were by now an average of six years older than their Allied counterparts. Many from the Normandy area were Oslegenen, Eastern Legions, conscripts, and volunteers from Turkestan, Russia, Mongolia, and elsewhere. Having been equipped for the most part with captured material, they were provided poor motorized transport by the Wehrmacht. Later arriving formations, like the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitlerjugend, were on the other hand drawn largely from a more youthful generation and much better equipped and trained than the static troops manning the coastline. In early 1944, OB West was significantly weakened by personnel and materiel transfers to the Eastern Front. During the Soviet Dnieper Carpathian Offensive, December 24, 1943, April 17, 1944, the Supreme German High Command had to redeploy the whole two SS Panzer Corps, including the 9th and 10th SS Panzer Divisions, the 349th Infantry Division, 507th Heavy Panzer Battalion, and the 311th and 322nd Stug Assault Gun Brigades. All told, 45,827 troops and 363 tanks, assault guns, and self-propelled anti-tank guns from the German forces headquartered in France were deprived. This was the first substantial transfer of forces from France to the east since the creation of Führer Directive 51 disallowed any more transfers from west to east. There had also been transfers to the Italian front. Von Rundstedt had complained that a lot of his best units had been sent on a fool's errand to Italy, calling it madness. That frightful boot of a country should have been evacuated. We should have held a decent front with a few divisions on the Alpine frontier. 1st SS Panzer Division Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler, 9th, 11th, 19th, and 116th Panzer Divisions, and the 2nd SS Panzer Division Das Reich, had arrived only during March to May 1944 in France for extensive refit, after being badly damaged during the Dnieper Carpathian Offensive. Of the 11 Panzer or Panzergrenadier divisions in France, seven remained at less than full strength or were still only partially mobile at the commencement of June 1944. The Wall the 1942 Nazi raids on Saint-Nazaire and Dieppe had panicked Hitler into ordering the fortifications that ran along the whole length of the Atlantic coastline from Spain to Norway. He and others planned some 15,000 emplacements, but due to shortages, particularly of concrete and manpower, most of the strong points were never built. Pa de Calais was heavily fortified since it was the most logical site for the much-anticipated invasion by the Allies. The port facilities of Cherbourg and St. Malo were, therefore, the best in the area. This included a report by Rundstedt to Hitler in October 1943, pointing out the thin defenses that existed in France, which turned out to be another factor motivating Hitler in appointing Rommel to oversee the construction of further fortifications along the expected invasion front stretching from the Netherlands to Cherbourg. Rommel was placed to command the newly reformed Army Group B, which comprised the 7th Army, the 15th Army, and the forces guarding the Netherlands. 
all that complexity of command at best only served to help Rommel in this mission within Nazi Germany. He was not supposed to give orders in some places, for instance, to Organization Todd, commanded by Armaments Minister Albert Speer, so he had to assign soldiers to do construction work. Rommel had therefore predicted this as the most probable site on the coast by far for the invasion and ordered heavy fortification there, with minefields, wire, and extensive construction of defensive works. He ordered large anti-tank obstacles, in addition to minefields, set on the beach to delay the approach of landing craft and impede the movement of tanks, and concrete gun emplacements at strategic points along the coast. He had most of these obstacles set at the high tide line, since he expected the Allies would land at high tide, so that the infantry would have less time exposed on the beach. Some six million mines were laid, tangles of barbed wire, booby traps, and the removal of ground cover, making the approach perilous for infantry. By Rommel's order, the minefields along the coast were increased in number threefold. Additionally, given such air supremacy, 4,029 Allied aircraft assigned to operations in Normandy plus 5,514 aircraft assigned to bombing and defense versus 570 Luftwaffe planes stationed in France and the Low Countries. Germans also erected booby trap stakes, which were known as Rommelspargel, to discourage airborne landings in meadows and fields. Reserves Rommel, in his part, having the idea that the Germans would improve their chances if the invasion was stopped at the shore, advised the keeping of the mobile reserves, especially tanks, as close to the coast as possible. Rundstedt and General Leo Geyer von Schweppenberg, who was commanding Panzer Group West, believed that the invasion could not be stopped on the beaches. Traditional doctrine argued for keeping Panzer formations concentrated in a central position around Paris and Rouen, using them only when the main beachhead of the Allies was identified and held. Geyer also noted that the armor deployed during the Italian campaign near the coast had been hit by naval bombardment. Rommel thought that the air superiority of the enemy is so overwhelming that it would make any large-scale movement of tanks soon after the invasion began hopeless. Hitler made the final decision. He left three divisions under the command of Geyer and gave Rommel the operational control of three tank divisions as a reserve. Hitler personally took control of the four divisions in strategic reserve, not to be used without his direct orders. The Invasion by May 1944, 1 1.5 million American troops had arrived in the United Kingdom, most of whom were housed in temporary camps in the southwest of England and made ready for their move across the channel to the western section of the landing zone. Accommodation was further east from Southampton to New Haven for British and Canadian troops, and even on the east coast for men who would be coming across in later waves. The complex system that managed this and saw to the departure from 20 points of all the men and vehicles on schedule was called movement control. Some men had to board their craft almost a week before departure. As a part of the preparation, minesweepers had started clearing lanes the evening before 6th of June. At the half-light of early morning, just before breaking into dawn, some 1,000 bombers left to attack the coastal defenses. At about 1,200 hours, England time, some 1,200 aircraft took off, carrying three airborne divisions to their drop zones a good way behind the areas where the beach landings would be made with the first plane to land behind Utah Beach at 0158. The American Airborne Divisions had drawn objectives on the Cotentin Peninsula west of Utah. The British 6th Airborne Division was given the mission of capturing, intact, the bridges over the Con Canal and River Orne. Free French 4th SAS Battalion of 538 men was assigned objectives in Brittany, Operation Dingson, Operation Samwest. Roughly 132,000 came by sea on D-Day, and another 24,000 by air. The preliminary naval bombardment commenced from five battleships, 20 cruisers, 65 destroyers, and two monitors at 5.45 hours, continuing up to 6.25 hours. The infantry were first to begin arriving on the beaches at about 6.30 hours. The current pushed the craft bearing the U.S. 4th Infantry Division assaulting Utah to a spot about 1,800 meters, 2,000 yards, south of their intended landing zone. The troops encountered light resistance and sustained fewer than 200 casualties. Their drive inland, however, fell one mile short of the D-Day objectives as they pushed across Utah Beach, they had moved up four miles and had established contact with the 101st Airborne Division. The airborne landings to the west of Utah were not very successful, with only about 10% making it to their drop zones. There was a shortage of radios, while at the same time, the hedgerows, stone walls, and marshes over the ground combined to make gathering the men into fighting units difficult. The 82nd Airborne Division had captured its prime objective around St. Mara Eglise and worked to protect the west flank. Because of its inability to capture the river crossings at the River Mer de Ray, this sealing off of the Cotentin Peninsula was delayed. 
the 101st Airborne Division helped protect the southern flank and succeeded in capturing the lock on the River Douve at La Barquette but missed two near-assigned bridges on the first day. Meanwhile, at Point du Hoc, the mission of some 200 men from the 2nd Ranger Battalion under Lt. Col. James Rutter was to scale the 30 meters, 98 feet, cliffs with ropes and ladders to destroy the gun battery located there. While under fire from above, the men scaled the cliff, only to discover that the guns had already been withdrawn. The rangers located the weapons unattended but operative in an orchard about 550 meters, 600 yards, to the south and disabled them. Under fire, the men at the point became cut off, however, some were captured. By dawn on D plus 1, 7th of June, Rudder had but 90 men still able to fight. The relieving force did not actually arrive until D plus 2, 8th of June, with the 743rd Tank Battalion. It had four sectors of its defense. The strongest, Omaha, was allocated to the U.S. 1st Infantry Division, with support from troops of the U.S. 29th Infantry Division. Opposite them was the unexpectedly complete 352nd Infantry Division, in contrast to the single regiment that had been expected. Strong currents forced many landing craft east of their intended position and delayed them. Casualties were higher than all the other landings put together, for the simple reason that the men were exposed to fire from the cliffs above them. Around 0830, the beach master closed the beach to further landings, as all attempts to clear the beach of obstructions had failed. A group of destroyers arrived to provide supporting artillery fire around this time. From Omaha, there were only five gullies through which to exit, and by late morning, barely 600 men had reached the higher ground. As noon approached and the artillery fire had taken its toll, the Germans were beginning to use up their ammunition. By this time, the Americans were therefore clearing some lanes on the beaches. They also began clearing the draws of enemy defenses in order to let the vehicles off from the beach. Over the following few days, the tenuous beachhead was expanded and extended, so that by D plus 3, 9th of June, the D-Day objectives had been achieved. At Gold, the landing craft faced severe difficulties due to high wind conditions. The amphibious DD tanks had to be landed much closer to the shoreline, contrary to the original plan of setting them down farther out. Aerial attacks failed to neutralize the Le Hamel strongpoint, whose 75mm gun continued to inflict damage until 1600 hours. The 1st Battalion, Hampshire Regiment, succeeded in capturing Armanche, the future site of Mulberry B, and on the eastern flank, there was a successful linkage with the Canadian forces at Juneau. The infantry landings at Juneau were delayed because of the rough seas, leading to men reaching the beach ahead of their supporting armor and suffering significant casualties during disembarkation. The preliminary bombardment largely missed the German defenses. Despite these challenges, the Canadians rapidly cleared the beach, creating two exits towards the villages above. The delay in taking Beni sur mer resulted in congestion on the beach, but by nightfall, the Juno and Gold beachheads, now contiguous, spanned an area 12 miles, 19 kilometers, wide and 7 miles, 10 kilometers, deep. On D-Day, a single troop from the 1st Hazar Tank Regiment was the only Allied unit to achieve its designated objective. At Juno, the casualty count stood at 961 men. On Sword, 21 out of 25 DD tanks managed to get safely ashore to provide cover for the infantry, who began disembarking at 7.30. The beach was cleared very rapidly, and a number of exits for the tanks were created. The tide came in surprisingly faster under windy conditions, making maneuvering the armor a critical challenge. The 2nd Battalion, King Shropshire Light Infantry advanced to within a few kilometers of Khan but had to withdraw, accounting for a lack of armor support. The counterattack between Sword and Juno by the German 21st Panzer Division nearly reached the coast but was halted around 1600 hours. They encountered stiff resistance from the British 3rd Infantry Division and were later withdrawn to address the breakthrough in the area between Khan and Bayou. The first components of the Mulberry Harbor were in place on D plus 1, 7th of June, and both harbors were being used for unloading by the middle of the month. One was built at Aramanche by the British, the other at Omaha by the Americans. Severe storms on 19th of June interrupted the landing of supplies and destroyed the Omaha Harbor. The harbor at Aramanche was repaired to cope with about 6,000 tons of material a day by the use of concrete caisson. It was utilized continuously for the next 10 months, but most shipments were brought over the beaches until the port of Cherbourg had been cleared of mines and obstructions on 16th of July. Allied casualties on the first day were at least 10,000, with 4,414 confirmed dead. The Germans lost 1,000 men. The Allied invasion plans had called for the capture of Carrington, St. Lo, Caen, and Bayou on the first day, with all the beaches, other than Utah, linked with a frontline 10 to 16 kilometers, 6 to 10 miles, from the beaches. 
this aim was not achieved. The five bridgeheads were not connected until 12 June, by which time the Allies held a front about 97 kilometers, 60 miles, long and 24 kilometers, 15 miles, deep. Khan, one of the main objectives and still in German hands by the end of D-Day, was not captured until the 21st of July. Almost 160,000 troops were able to cross the English Channel on 6th of June, and by the end of August, more than 2 million Allied soldiers had arrived in France. American troops were tasked with landing in the Cotentin Peninsula, particularly aiming to seize Cherbourg, which would offer the Allies a crucial deep water harbor in the western part of the lodgement. The terrain behind Utah and Omaha beaches presented the challenge of Bocage country, characterized by hedgerows atop 3 to 4 feet, 0.91 to 1.2 meters, embankments with ditches on either side. This landscape was further fortified with many rifle pits and machine gun emplacements, while most roads were too narrow for tanks. The Germans had also inundated the fields behind Utah with seawater up to 2 miles, 3.2 kilometers, from the coast. The German defense on the peninsula comprised the 91st Infantry Division and the 243rd and 709th Static Infantry Divisions. By D plus 3, Allied commanders had come to the realization that Cherbourg would not be swiftly captured. To prevent further German reinforcements from arriving, a strategic decision was made to isolate the peninsula. Following the unsuccessful efforts of the inexperienced 90th Infantry Division, Major General J. Lawton Collins, the 7th Corps commander, reassigned the mission to the seasoned 9th Infantry Division. By 17 June, they had reached the west coast of Cotentin, effectively isolating Cherbourg. Following fierce battles, the 9th Division, reinforced by the 4th and 79th Infantry Divisions, secured the peninsula. Cherbourg was finally captured on 26 June, but by that time, the Germans had demolished the port facilities. It wasn't until September that these facilities were restored to full operational status. The conflict in the Khan area against the 21st Panzer, the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitler Jugend, and other units quickly became a stalemate. In Operation Perch, 30 Corps aimed to advance south toward Mont Ponson but soon shifted strategy to a pincer movement to encircle Khan. The 30th Corps, including parts of the 7th Armored Division, attempted a flanking move from Tilly sur Sules toward Villers Bocage, while I Corps sought to bypass Khan to the east. The effort by I Corps was quickly stopped, and although 30 Corps momentarily captured Villers Bocage, they faced an ambush leading to the prolonged Battle of Villers Bocage and then the Battle of the Box, resulting in a retreat to Tilly sur Sules. Operation Epsom commenced on 26 June after a delay due to storms, marking an attempt by 8 Corps to approach Khan from the southwest and establish a bridgehead south of the Odon. Despite failing to capture Khan, the operation inflicted significant tank losses on the Germans, who had committed all available panzer units. Following these events, Rundstedt was dismissed on 1 July, replaced by Field Marshal Gunter von Kluge after declaring the war lost. Subsequent efforts, including Operation Charnwood on 8 to 9 July, and Operations Atlantic and Goodwood from 18 to 21 July, eventually secured Khan and its surrounding high ground, leaving the city nearly destroyed. Amidst these military operations, an assassination attempt on Hitler occurred on 20 July. The Breakout After advancing to San Lo within the Cotentin Peninsula, the U.S. First Army initiated Operation Cobra on 25 July, pushing further south to Avranche by 1 August. Concurrently, the British commenced Operation Blue Coat on 30 July to take fire in the strategic high ground of Mont Ponson. With Lt. Gen. Patton's U.S. Third Army becoming active on 1 August, it swiftly conquered most of Brittany and territories extending as far south as the Loire. Meanwhile, the First Army continued its eastward pressure towards Le Mans to guard its flank. By 3 August, Patton's forces had stationed a small contingent in Brittany and pivoted eastward, aiming for the main German forces south of Caen. Despite Field Marshal Kluge's protests, Hitler commanded a counteroffensive, known as Operation Ludisch, from Weyer towards Avranche on 4 August. As the 2nd Canadian Corps advanced south from Caen towards Falaise and Operation Totalize on 8 August, Bradley and Montgomery saw an opportunity to encircle the bulk of the German forces at Falaise. The 3rd Army pressed the encirclement from the south, reaching Alençon by 11 August. Despite Hitler's insistence on a counterattack until 14 August, Kluge and his officers began planning an eastward retreat. Hitler's insistence on making all major decisions greatly hampered German forces, causing up to 24-hour delays in orders as information was relayed to and from his residence in Obersalzberg, Bavaria. On the evening of 12 August, Patton sought Bradley's permission to continue northward to close the gap around German forces, which Bradley declined, citing Montgomery's assignment of the 1st Canadian Army to the task from the north. 
the Canadians faced stiff resistance but captured Falaise by 16th of August. The gap was finally closed on 21st of August, trapping 50,000 German troops, although over a third of the German 7th Army and remnants of 9 of the 11 Panzer divisions escaped east. Montgomery's handling of the Falaise Gap drew criticism from American commanders, notably Patton, though Bradley was more sympathetic, doubting Patton's ability to close the gap. This strategic moment has sparked extensive debate among historians, with criticisms directed at American, British, and Canadian forces. On 15th of August, Hitler replaced Kluge with Field Marshal Walter Model as commander of OB West. Kluge committed suicide on 19th of August after his involvement in the 20th of July plot was discovered. Additionally, the Allied invasion of southern France, Operation Dragoon, commenced on 15th of August. The French resistance in Paris rose against the Germans on 19th of August. Eisenhower initially wanted to bypass the city to focus on other objectives. However, faced with reports of the citizens suffering and Hitler's intention to destroy Paris, de Gaulle insisted on its immediate liberation. French forces of the 2nd Armored Division under General Philippe Leclerc approached from the west on 24th of August, supported by the U.S. 4th Infantry Division from the south. After scattered overnight skirmishes, Paris was liberated by the morning of 25th of August. Operations persisted in the British and Canadian sectors until the month's end. On 25th of August, the U.S. 2nd Armored Division battled into El Buf, linking up with British and Canadian Armored Divisions. The 2nd Canadian Infantry Division ventured into the Foray de la Lande on 27th of August, facing strong resistance. Over three days, the 4th and 6th Canadian Brigades sustained many casualties as the Germans conducted a delaying action in defense-friendly terrain. The Germans retreated on 29th of August, crossing the Seine the following day. On 30th of August, the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division crossed the Seine near El Buf and was warmly welcomed in Rouen. Closing the Campaign Eisenhower assumed direct command of all Allied ground forces on 1st of September, motivated by concerns over potential German counterattacks and the scarcity of materiel in France. Opting for a broad front approach rather than narrow thrusts, the Allies linked up the Normandy forces with those in southern France on 12th of September, pushing towards the Siegfried Line. Montgomery's Operation Market Garden on 17th of September, an attempt to secure bridges in the Netherlands for crossing into Germany, did not succeed. The Allied advance was tempered by German resistance and a dire shortage of supplies, notably fuel. On 16th of December, the Germans mounted their last major Western Front offensive, the Ardennes Offensive, known as the Battle of the Bulge. A succession of Soviet victories began with the Vistula Oder Offensive on 12th of January. Hitler's suicide on 30th of April, as Soviet troops approached his Berlin bunker, preceded Germany's surrender on May 7, 1945. The Normandy landing stood as history's largest seaborne invasion, involving nearly 5,000 landing and assault craft, 289 escort vessels, and 277 minesweepers. Opening another front in Western Europe dealt a significant psychological blow to the German military, which feared the repeat of a two-front war like in World War I. This event marked the beginning of the race for Europe between Soviet forces and Western powers, considered by some historians as the onset of the Cold War. Victory in Normandy came through various factors, including incomplete German preparations along the Atlantic Wall, where Rommel noted construction was only 18% complete in some areas due to resource diversion. Operation Fortitude's success in deceiving the Germans forced them to defend a vast coastline. Allied air superiority prevented German observations of British preparations and bombings. Allied bombing and French resistance efforts severely disrupted French transport infrastructure. While much of the initial artillery barrage missed its mark, Specialized armor provided effective support for troops landing on the beaches, except at Omaha. The German high command's indecision and complex command structure also contributed to Allied success. Losses of Allies From D-Day to 21st of August, the Allies landed approximately 2,052,299 men in northern France, bearing the high cost of the Normandy campaign. The American armies endured 124,394 casualties from 6 June to the end of August, with 20,668 killed and 10,128 missing. The 1st Canadian and 2nd British armies suffered 83,045 casualties, including 15,995 killed, 57,996 wounded, and 9,054 missing. Of these, Canadian losses totaled 18,444, with 5,021 killed in action. Notably, one in seven Canadian soldiers killed between 6 and 11 June was executed after surrendering, in incidents known as the Normandy Massacres. 
Allied air forces flew 480,317 sorties in support of the invasion, losing 4,101 aircraft and 16,714 aircrew, 8,536 from the ASAF and 8,178 under RAF command. The Free French SAS paratroopers had 77 killed, with 197 wounded and missing. Allied tank losses are estimated at about 4,000, evenly divided between American and British-slash-Canadian armies. Historians' estimates on overall casualties during the campaign slightly differ, ranging from 225,606 to 226,386. Losses of Germany during the three months of Operation Overlord, Allied forces in northern France captured a total of 233,000 German soldiers, with captures escalating from 47,000 in June to 150,000 in August. Around 80,000 German soldiers are interred in Normandy, a figure that encompasses those who perished prior to the battle and those who died in captivity post-conflict. German forces reported a total of 158,930 men lost from D-Day to 14th of August, just before Operation Dragoon began in southern France. In the Falaise pocket action, 50,000 German soldiers were lost, including 10,000 killed and 40,000 captured. However, total German casualties during this period remain subject to variation among sources. Nicholas Setterling noted OB West reported 289,000 casualties during summer 1944 in the West, inclusive of Operation Dragoon, delineating 23,019 killed, 67,060 wounded, and 198,616 missing. Setterling suggested these figures might underestimate some losses, like those at Cherbourg, estimating total German army casualties in Normandy from 6 June to August as 210,000, with an acknowledgement of potential additional losses at overrun air or naval bases, though specific figures for such instances weren't available for his study. Further estimations of German casualties reach upwards to 530,000 in total, incorporating both killed or wounded and captured. German tank losses in Normandy are uncertain. Approximately 2,300 tanks and assault guns were committed to the battle, with only 100 to 120 managing to cross the Seine by the campaign's end. Despite official German reports of only 481 tanks destroyed up to 31 July, Allied assessments, including research by the No. 2 Operational Research Section of the 21st Army Group, indicate that around 1,050 tanks were destroyed throughout June, July, and August. Luftwaffe losses amounted to 2,127 aircraft. By the campaign's conclusion, 55 German divisions were rendered combat ineffective, with seven being disbanded. By September, OB West possessed only 13 infantry divisions, three panzer divisions, and two panzer brigades rated as combat effective. Losses of civilians During the liberation of Normandy, between 13,632 and 19,890 French civilians lost their lives, and many more were seriously injured. Adding to this toll, an estimated 11,000 to 19,000 Normans were killed during pre-invasion bombings. Throughout the war, around 70,000 French civilians were killed. Even after the campaign ended, the local population continued to suffer casualties due to landmines and unexploded ordnance. Schaeff had issued directives, later forming the basis of the 1954 Hague Convention Protocol I, emphasizing the need to spare French heritage sites from destruction. These sites, listed in the official civil affairs lists of monuments, were not to be occupied without high-level command approval. Despite these precautions, church spires and other stone buildings were damaged or destroyed to prevent German use. Efforts were made to prevent reconstruction workers from using rubble from significant ruins for road repairs and to search for artifacts. Notably, the Bayeux tapestry and other valuable cultural items, stored at the Château de Sorches near Le Mans since the war's start, survived intact. The German occupiers also compiled a list of protected buildings, intending to preserve them for German military use. Many Norman cities and towns were devastated by combat and bombings. After the Battle of Caen, only 8,000 habitable spaces remained for a population exceeding 60,000. In Caen, out of 18 listed churches, four were seriously damaged, and five destroyed, along with 66 other monuments. In Calvados, home to the Normandy beachheads, 76,000 people were left homeless. From Khan's pre-war Jewish community of 210, only one individual survived the war. Looting occurred among all parties, retreating Germans, invading allies, and local French civilians. However, Allied forces never condoned looting, and perpetrators were punished. Memorials The beaches of Normandy continue to be recognized by their D-Day codenames. These historic locations are marked with plaques, memorials, or small museums, with guidebooks and maps readily available for visitors. 
Some German fortifications, such as Point du Hoc, remain almost as they were in 1944. The remnants of Mulberry Harbor B are still visible off the coast of Aramanche. The region is home to several large cemeteries where many of the Allied and German soldiers who fell during the Normandy campaign are buried. One of the most significant memorial sites is the Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial, situated atop a bluff overlooking the English Channel at Omaha Beach. This site, spanning 172.5 acres, is the final resting place for 9,388 American military personnel who died during the Normandy invasion and subsequent operations in World War II. Among those buried here are Army Air Corps crews downed over France as early as 1942 and four American women. Thanks for watching the Animated General channel. If you found the video interesting and want some more go on and hit that subscribe button. The Animated General out.